is the idea of, of, of what I do is that people are looking to understand the value of the piece. So the value of the piece is not my opinion of the piece. The value of the piece is the track record of the artist in a certain genre. So the track record being what he sold or she sold in the past. And I do appraise works that are by new artists, that emerging artists. But how I do that is I compare it to other artists with eight factors similar. So I would compare, for example, if I didn't know you, I would compare your work in size, in, um, in, in uh, palette, in, in theme, uh, in presentation, in media. And there are, like say, eight factors. I would say, now, who paints like this in these eight factors? And I would try to come as close as I could to that artist who sells Always. Interesting. It's not on what you could, it's not hypothetical. It's actually based on consummated sales. So how the art market works is consummated sales. It's if it's sold, then what are the factors? Oh, yeah, and so it's not speculative. Interesting, so it's what's sold, what it's people what's sold. want. I mean, whether it's good or not, whether it's <laughs> compositionally perfect or not, that's not the point. It's what people are Whether it's interested. culture, H&M, it's, it's driven by the range. customer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether they know what they're seeing or not, because you have to train them to see. So, so if they don't yes. know what they're seeing, but, but they, they buy it, yes, that's right. what the value comes from that? The, the, the value in the art market comes from consummated sales. Consummated sales. Sales that are done. So you start with what you could sell it for, as a, you know, if you've sold something, now you have one data point or two data That's points. That's exactly right. So you start from there, and then you say, you tweak that. You, you can do that with your own work, but mm -hmm. what I, uh, that's a great thing. But what I'm suggesting, if you don't know, and you're jumping into this pool, and you don't know what to price your work, I would compare it to other artists you know who paint like you, who have sold, and start, like I said at the beginning of my talk, you know, uh, all of my artist friends who don't, they don't like to be seen going to other people's shows and galleries, but they do it because they're looking to see, you know, what, what, what's the price point here? How are they selling and what, what's their, what are their price points? And I hate to say that because, you know, basically it's, you're doing your research as to where your price point should be. But you are, identify your work for what it is and say, these are the elements that make my work in really concrete terms, you know, the, the, like I said, the subject, the size, the medium, the blah, 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 blah. Experience, where you are in your career. And, and yeah, and your teachers, your teachers, and you say, because your mentors are a big deal in the art world, so you say, okay, now this is, now I'm gonna compare that with these artists that I already, that I know sell. I do it all the time for, for artists that are coming into the market, because we get a whole range, we get like 20, Different or, or different artists that that work like you, and then we crunch those numbers. Oh, yeah, Polly. No more. We artists, we all know that number one selling of the world is landscapes, and this reflects right here too because most of the work here is landscape related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, so. Um, What do I have to say about that? So there's classic neuroscience goes into this, which is that a landscape has a horizon line. And that is the most basic of all experiences in our world, which is earth, sky, horizon line. And it's easy because we all could recognize that. And so, you know, that's why I'm suggesting that it's, um, your, your buyer will say, I buy what I like. Yeah. Because they know they, it's an experience they have had. But there are certain shapes and themes that I will dare say they're archetypal. Mm -hmm. And landscape work calls that forth. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is a big, a big deal in art history. Mm -hmm. Should we look at some? Yes. 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 So, so, will someone pick something for me to look at? Should we start, start with this? From the left. Yeah. Okay, so how I look at work, I'll give you a couple of, and I, I have all, all, all kinds of handouts I can show you, and if you're interested, 
take my card and if you want to know my uh, way of looking at pieces, I can definitely share some writings that I've done in the past. But what I do, the first thing when I look at a, a, a work is, um, you're going you're gonna to laugh probably. You turn it upside down? Yeah, I, I turn it upside down. Yeah. You can do that when you paint it too. Yeah, and yes, I, I do. Yeah, and then um, another thing I do is um, I cover up an accent area or accent color. Um, I reframe it in my head a little bit. <coughs> So what am I looking for when I do that? I'm looking, first of all, I'm looking to see that the composition works. So the composition should work no matter what angle you have the piece. If it's upside down, sideways, it should work. If I'm covering something up and the piece falls apart, I realize that that's probably a pretty good piece. Why is that? It's based on the uh, idea of poetry. For example, if you've got a, son a sonnet, you take out one line of the sonnet, the poem falls apart. A work of art should be integral. It should have a shape. If you take one thing out and it falls apart, that is a way to say that's a pretty darn good piece because it's, um, it has its integrity right there. So if, if you take, like for example, in this piece, watch, watch this, watch this. Look at that. Works. Huh? Oh. That's all. I just want to see it. You see that work is falling apart. You see? Yeah. It falls apart. Likewise, it, it means nothing. So that, if I can take something out and the work falls apart for me, it speaks to me. And I think it's a good, it's probably pretty good work just because it, it has a fullness to it, right? So, you know, likewise, you flip, you can flip stuff. You can really take a look at that. See, this works for me <laughs> all ways. Yeah. I really like that. What I, what, I, what I don't like about this, perhaps, is that, um, remember I was talking to you about genre. So in this work, uh, let's see if I can do this. It's trying to be two things at once, I think. So it's trying to be a, a, an abstraction of a horizon, but it's also trying to, to bring a three-dimensional quality to it. So it's got a foreground. This is a flat picture plane. It doesn't need a foreground. So watch. It doesn't need this. Here. You see? It doesn't need it. It, it implies dimension even though it has this. It doesn't, it, that's just how I think about it was, I think that this, this is not needed. I, I don't think, I think, Basically, it's, it, it's nice because it makes it a square, but I don't think we need to establish that as our entry point. Why? We already have an entry point. So where is our entry point? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So our <coughs> entry point is, let's see if I have a, uh, a long thing here. So here's our entry point. So when you think, remember I was saying the artist's hand, the artist's eye? Where's the artist's hand? Where's the artist's eye? Where's your entry point? The entry point is here, right here. Whoosh. You see? Here's your entry point. Do you see what I'm saying? Your entry point is right there. And it comes at this angle. It comes from this side at this angle. Okay, where's your entry point here? Where's your entry point there? Probably where the two colors meet. Yeah, so it's right here, but it comes from here comes from here, doesn't it? You see that angle? Yeah. There's your entry point. So, um, I, what I like about this is I like, so you can always tell a good artist by how they deal with the flat planes of the sky. And I like that there's an implied dimension to this sky. So I, I like both of these a lot. So on this one, so this is interesting because this is a, more of an abstraction, but it's also what we call in genres expressionism. You know what I'm saying when I say it's expressionistic? So it's expressionistic. 
What do I like about this? Well, let's take away some pieces. All right, let's take this away. I think, I think it's nice. We, you take this away, the balance is wrong. Mm -hmm. So now you think, okay, now where's your entry point? Where's your entry point? Well, in this, there's multiple entry points. So when you deal with a work like this and there's multiple entry points, you have to lead the viewer's eye in a circular fashion so they know where to go. So within that piece, where are you going? So in this, your entry point is here. But it's also there. So it's also here. And what she's doing, or he's doing with this piece is with the colors, your eye is going round. So you don't have depth there, but you have a roundness there. And likewise, if we flipped it upside down, et cetera, et cetera, it wouldn't read as well because it's a recognizable face. It's one of the first things we do when we're babies. We start to think about face. Uh, on this, let's see, what are we going to do with this? Mm. I like that. Oh, that's nice. That's really nice, huh? This is more interesting as the original. Sometimes this is a really good point. Sometimes this is a really good point. Another thing, I want to get back to this one piece for a, one quick minute. One thing that an unexperienced buyer or art buyer will look at is the quality of your signature. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole big school of, you, you know, you should never sign your work. And I always, you know, I, t I taught for many years and people would say, well, my professors, they say it's, it's de classe, we shouldn't sign our work, <coughs> etc. Well, uh, my suggestion is you, you make my job really hard if you don't sign your work and you become famous. <laughs> and I got to praise you in a, another 10, 15 years. But I also will suggest that a signature, well done signature, adds to the composition if you do it right. I know I get a lot of pushback on that, but. Uh, okay, so on this, let's, let's do this. Wow, terrible, right? Look at that. You see, that's your darkest accent area. We're going to take that away. It goes flat. Goes flat. Likewise. Not so bad, but not good. So where is your, let's say this is the way it's meant to hang. Where is your uh, entry point? Now this is interesting because this is a vista, implied vista. So the artist hand and the artist eye is two separate things. So where's your, where's your entry point? If it was hanging like this, where was your entry point? Yes. It's right here. It's here. Right there, at that angle. Yeah. So why is it important to recognize? Because you want to watch when people look at your work where their eyes are going. Watch their eyes when they look at your work. And if they're staying with the work for a longer period of time, look at how their eyes are moving. And you'll see, they're looking to where, where Where's that anchor? Where are they? Where, where am I supposed to be looking? That's why I say in my lecture, you're teaching them perception, because you're teaching them where their eyes should go. So I would say this needs a uh, signature. Um, so th these are my, uh, my, my cheat sheet for the, the things that I try to teach beginning collectors. You know, flip a work of art 80 degrees, a good work of art being, if it's a film, a painting, a poem, a novel, should contain all the elements needed to deliver a feeling, a revelation, and a message of whatever the aim of the work is, and should contain nothing extraneous. So one thing to do if you walk through a gallery space with an artist friend is ask this friend about form. What form do you see? Form, form, form. It's not about the the representation, it's about the form, because the form gives it the composition. Then I always carry a three by five card, I take out elements, um, I, look at, I look at the signature, and then I, I actually look at the quality of the painter himself, or herself, or sculptor, I look to see do they understand their medium? You know, 
Do they know how painting, how paint moves on canvas? Do they know what brush strokes mean? Do they know how to treat a canvas? Do they understand sculpting? Do they understand dimension if their work is, okay, it, this is a big key in art uh, uh, scholarship in general, is to stick true to the integrity of the work. So if you are putting yourself as, out as a three-dimensional sculptor, then you are a three-dimensional sculptor. So you, in other words, if you put yourself out as a painter in oil, you better understand the oil. If you understand sculpting, you understand the bronze, you understand the medium. And you know, you really, it's super important to, to, to do that because you can't cheat on that. Um, two little pieces. Wet paint, do not touch. Oh, no, <laughs> they're not wet. So I actually put those out because um, so my question to you is, the bottom one is, if you can see over there, I have a wall of hearts. The bottom one um, is acrylic. And um, uh, so there's two, two questions for here. Uh, the one on top is in oil, and it's, it's not quite finished. But like you can see the difference in what goes into them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much yeah, faster yeah. when yeah. I'm doing much slower. Yeah, yeah. On it's the same size canvas, yeah. and I'm just introducing the oils on that size. I sell the hearts for $60 a piece. Um, so there's also a question of multiples. When you're selling multiples like that, my goal is to hopefully get people to buy many of them to hang together. Um, but I will price them individually for quick sales as well, right? So my suggestion is, first of all, I love how these hang, I love that they uh, speak to each other when they're together. I like that. But unless you show your public that they speak to each other, they're not gonna see it if they're displayed. They're not going to put it together. Right. So, so really, so the question is in two parts. So the question is, first of all, if I'm charging sixty dollars for the hearts for the same size canvas, and I charge one hundred twenty-five for the blueberry and in oils, do you know what I mean? Like, how do you? So this is, speaks to how to price these things. You know. Well, oil is always perceived as being a better quality medium, but then you're buying. How many people know when they look at it? The tops and oil, the bottoms acrylic. Right, so I wouldn't put these together. These are no, 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 no. Like, what I'm saying is, you're asking that you see, Elizabeth. Do you think I can charge twice as much for the oil? How do you deal with that difference if somebody asks? You say it's oil, and therefore I charge more. Okay. But your public is not going to notice the difference. Okay. They just aren't. Okay. So then the second question is speaks to so where do I give a price break for buying multiples or something like that, or for a triptych, like what's up top? Um, I have priced them together and I've priced them separately, but where do you, like, I'm probably a guest on all of it. So, like, where are you, uh, how, like, how do you figure out how to price things together separately? Where do, where do the breaks come from? Do you want to charge more separately, less as a trip tech? You know what I mean? Like, where do you make the price breaks? How do you? Well, I can, ref I can refer you to tradition. So, what you do is you give um, a accepted gallery discount. So if you have a repeat customer to your gallery, you give them 20%. Okay. That's it. it's, it's like a courtesy. A courtesy. All the great galleries, they give 20%. They have Mrs. So-and-so coming back, they give 20%. So, you know, that's like an industry standard. But that's assuming a second visit. If I have somebody yeah, who's right. looking at the Swallow of Hearts, and they're debating getting one or four, and I'm trying to talk them into four, do I give a big price break to make that happen? Do I wait until I'm selling a wall of them to make that price break happen? Do I make the price break at three? Do I make it at 10? Do I, you know what I mean? Like, where do you, within the same sale, when I'm looking to sell to one person, where do I, before I undersell myself, where do I throw it on there? You know what I mean? I would really look at them and say, can I, uh, not ask them in words, but look at them and say, do they, are they the type of person that wants to pay more? <laughs> are they the type of person that wants to pay less? What kind of car do you drive? No, no, that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with, you know, my God, you know, I have I, my um, uh, office manager, I have another, uh, another office in Atlanta, so I have an East Coast uh, office as well. And my uh, office manager in Atlanta has been with me almost 30 years. And he buys expensive men's watches. I mean, big money. That's what he loves. And he'll say, I spend blah, 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 blah. He's the type of person who wants to spend more. Right. He's not going to buy my hearts. 
to begin with. <laughs> 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 if you buy the oils. If you can buy 500 of them together. See, but you got to kind of know your claim, but you can look at them. You can really look at you know. So that's good for me, right, to individually if I'm talking this, but we're in a collective. So I'm only here one day a week, and somebody else is selling my work. So I would like to leave oh, yeah. that information with the gallery. So here, Mike, here's a, a good topic for another guest speaker, is the psychology of selling. I mean, there are people in the business world that make this their whole career. And if you were to do a little seminar on who's selling at what point in, in the gallery at any given day, just simple hints about how to kind of reel in that sale. And one of the things that um, I had when I first started in a gallery situation, I had a friend of mine who um, sold me a used car, kind of a periphery acquaintance, He's a friend, and he became a, a good friend, and he was a used car de dealer. That's what he did. And he taught me how to sell. He said, somebody comes to my lot, and I've got a used car. I say to them, how would that car, I mean, just tell me what your driveway looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. They describe the driveway, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So how does that connect to the house? Mm -hmm. Find the marble. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, no, 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 he's not looking for how much money they uh. have. He's looking for them to put that car in, in their the mind driveway. on the driveway gotcha. and walk to the house put it on with them. their groceries. And their so walls job to great. make them think cool. about where they put it on their walls. Or on so, you know, these are things that I'm not qualified to give you a lecture on that, but I know there are people out there that are mm -hmm. so good at that manipulation of selling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do this, this really interesting You're going to have to slide it out. I see. Well, I can look at it upside down this way. So what I like about this, uh, I like that it's got a movement to it. And I, I think this movement is wonderful. This, this swirl, I think that's a great, a great movement. I like that. Um, I think that the, the, for, the, per, the perception of depth in this is really nice. Thank you for coming. I think that the perception of depth in here is really nice, even though it's an abstraction, because you get this really interesting use of color in the foreground, you see? This adds a huge sense of depth. Here's your deep point in the, in the work. So I like that. I like the fact it's so shiny. I like the fact it's very tactile. I think that's very cool. Um, the signature is nice. I mean, isn't that stupid of me? It's like I, the signature is good, but... Of course, once you sign it, you told them where... I mean, if you're doing a completely abstract piece, once you signed it, then you're telling the observer what's top, what's bottom. Yes, yeah, so, and so that's a lot of times... You can <coughs> sign it on the back. Yeah, sign it on the, we call it verso. Mm -hmm. Sign it verso then. You know, don't give them a clue, but, you know, because, but sign it verso, but sign it, I think, because what am I going to do in 20 years? What about I have to appraise It's the sign on the outside and the sides of it. Yeah, head. it's okay, but it's, that's a little bit like, eh. I mean, the classic, it, 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 you sign left bottom, right bottom, you sign bad, verso. And the side, eh, eh, eh. I mean, you know, I'm telling traditions. Mm -hmm. And so what else do we have? We have anything else? Well, I guess I'm done then. Uh, uh, is there any other? Uh, bunny bunny yeah. rabbits. Uh, it's what now? The bunny rabbits. On the wall? On the uh, wall. Sculptures? Well, OK. So let's talk a little bit about Jeff Koons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's uh, a tradition in art. And that tradition is like, you know, falls upon the shoulders of other artists. You guys know all about that. So, you know, you have this, um, this stylized uh, images like this and, I, and the stuffed animals and this sort of thing. I think they're fabulous, but they fall, they're, they're recognizable um, images. Because they fall on the heels of other images that are takeoffs on cartoon figures. 
And it's, it's a little bit slap in the face to the art world because it's not really art, but it kind of is when Jeff Koons can sell something for $70 million. You know, a balloon, Dachshund dog, you know, kind of thing. So, um, but I think it's great because it's very irreverent. Um, this one I think is fantastic. This one with the green and the open uh, brown work. It's just, it's really imaginative and interesting. And I really like this. I think I would, I would light it different. Mm -hmm. I do, I think that this lighting, I, I, I never liked incandescent with, with yeah. work. I really don't like incandescent with work. Because it, it sucks the color right out, I think. So right. I think, I, think I, would, I would light it different. I think I would do different scale of it. I think I would do some a little taller and I would do, it, 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 and I would, I would do, you know, different levels so that they're not all the same level. What would you charge for the small ones? Ooh. Would you price point those up? Well, what, we got twenty bucks. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. When, when Mike brings you a, a great marketing person, mm -hmm. they're going to tell you round figures don't sell as well as nineteen ninety nine <laughs> or whatever it is, nineteen ninety seven or whatever. But I mean, twenty dollars flat. Um, somehow, you don't see that much at your retail situations. There's always. I mean, isn't it stupid? Because I'm talking to a bunch of artists. But a flat figure is harder for people because it's like, is there a difference? If you've got something that you'll pay fifteen ninety nine for versus twenty four ninety nine, is there really a difference? Not much. I mean, nobody's thinking that way. It's twenty. Both are twenty. Yeah. You see. They're both 20. So it seems like a made-up number, that's why. Right. Yeah, yeah, which you wouldn't want to do in, yeah. in, in an art. In, in $1,000 right. is a made-up number. Yeah, but, but you know, $1, normally I, art is not priced that way. Normally art, you know, like a painting, you don't put a... Yeah. A 99. Okay, okay, okay. But this, this, uh, this is irreverent mm -hmm. and it's meant to thumb its nose at the established way of making art and selling art. So you might as well reflect that in the price. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, and do you think that's 20 is the right price of that range, 1999? It's hard to say. You'd want to see what other artists sell such starter pieces to get them interested in you as, a, you know, as an artist. You'd want to see what other artists, I mean, I hate to say it, but not to say that your work is not totally unique, but there are other artists that work in at least those eight characteristics that I try to identify for my artists. There are at least somebody that's going to be six or seven of those same characteristics. So you might want to do like a little bit of, of homework and see what other, what other people sell those, part, you know, those things for. Sal, I was waiting for you to say something. I would love to hear you say a little something about the, going back to what you said about um, genre bending or mixing works, because that's sort of where I fall in the category. Yeah, it's and, it's difficult because the the way that art is sold. And it really is like I can never say my work is this or this because if I say it's photography, it's camera based. I get a ton of people saying that's not photography or what is this doing here, and you know. But if I say they're paintings, then and a lot of people will just call them paintings, but they're technically not. And you get some people get really pissed because. <laughs> <laughs> then this goes to your point, which be. is what are we going to do going forward in the world when all these genres are changing? But the established, you know, I've been appraising for many years, and the established genre, when I research, when I go to an auction, when I get an auction catalog, they don't, it's <clears throat> photos and paintings and works on paper and multiples in, in, in print work. It's well, again, is it a work on paper or is it a on right, canvas? Right, right, right. You print it so, on the canvas? No, it's printed it on, on the canvas. Paper. Paper. Oh, and then, and then mounted. Then mounted right, but you also often paint on the, sub, on the canvas before you yeah. put it on. So there is painting element to it. This work is really unique. Actually, what do you want it's going to be difficult. Uh -huh. I, I am a photographer. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say that, you know, if I was working, at, I worked at Christie's for a while, downtown uh, New York, they would probably classify it as photography, 
and they would call it new media. So there's a subcategory to photography auctions and it's new media. That's at least a start of where it could go in the future. I started to just on a ball tag type thing or you know, like label called them metagraphs. Just because if people have to ask me that, they go, wait, what's a metagraph? That's a good idea. And it's a conversation opener. Um, but I'm not sure if that really works because I can't really say it's improved the sales. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, like, uh, I, was, I was really happy to know that our St. Barbara Museum of Art has a curator of photography and new media. New media, I think. That's the title. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's his title. It's, photography and new media. So at least we've got a little, in the very established fortress of the okay. art world, right. okay. we've got a little bit of movement there. You had a question? Yeah, I have a question about galleries and what they value sometimes, and there's different levels of galleries. So, yeah. For instance, with photography, um, they may not like photographs printed on canvas. We don't have canvas photographs in our gallery, something like that. So how much is driven by the gallery, or does it depend on the, the, the prestige of the gallery? Like right. They don't want aluminum, or they don't want canvas, or it looks too commercial, or... Right. You, know. you remember I was saying that in, in, in my talk, my prepared talk, I said, if you expect a gallery to accept you and then go to their mailing list and have a great opening evening for you, it probably won't work, because what galleries are interested is what made them over X thousands of dollars before. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, this sorts of wo this work appeals to our clients, and therefore mm -hmm. we're going to do the same type of work. Because a gallery is interested in the bottom line, and they're interested because they're business. But uh, it too, in terms of appraisal, though, uh -huh. is the gallery the appraiser at that point, rather than the value itself the gallery. Well, the that gallery, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So the gallery will set a value, but they'll set a value based on, the, remember I said eight areas of similarity, so we made this much when we sold something that was at least six areas of similarity to yours. And I mean, it's a business, so they're thinking like a business, and they're thinking this is going to be like what sold in the past, and they don't set the price, how they, they'll work with you on the price. But there's two ways you can work with the gallery. One is to say, you take my piece and I charge you, say, if my piece is going to be sold for four grand, you give me two grand. And I don't care what you make on it, but generally they're going to be four or over. The gallery will always double or triple. The other way of <coughs> working with the gallery is to say, yes, sir. Going on to that subject, um, how kosher is it to price your work less in the studio versus what it would be in the gallery? Yes. Like if you have a published price list, yeah. you know, this is my pricing. Yeah. You talk to galleries about it, you know, that it's priced yeah. there. Yeah. Then you're in your studio yeah. and you sell for a third of that or for half of that or two thirds of that published price. It happens a lot. Yeah. So if I'm doing an appraisal, in fact, I just finished one this morning where uh, most of these are living artists. She had a staple of 20 living artists in her <coughs> collection. And most of them sold out of three galleries at least. And they sold out of their own studio too. And what, what you generally, um, you would expect that if, how do you say this? If you had a real long-term relationship with a gallery and you would say, I, I would like the opportunity to sell to this person just because they approached me on my own, then you would let them say, well, I, we really would like to sell for you because we represent you exclusively. But if you're not represented exclusively, in the case you've got three galleries that represent you, then there's a little more leeway. I mean, classically, what you would do is. But wouldn't they give you a reading off? Like, we're going to be exclusive in Santa Fe, New Mexico, or New Mexico, no, exclusive in Los Angeles. Galleries here in Santa Barbara. Yeah, right. It's a hard one because you don't want to step on their toes, you know, the gallery's toes or the collector's toes. But a lot of galleries. Um, they would consider that the work that they choose to hang of yours to be higher quality because they're choosing from your stable of work the pieces they want to hang 
So that may be a justification for, for them to charge more, but you wouldn't want to say that to a client who comes to you directly. So it's a hard one. It's, it's, a, it's an age old one. And I know in appraising, I had a woman, she's like, I, I don't believe you are, you're worth your salt as an appraiser because I bought this for two grand and you're telling me it's 800. Yeah, because I called the artist. <laughs> How much is this worth, worth if, it, if it burnt in the fire, which it did, so we have to replace it? What would you charge the client? 800. She said, no, no, I spent two grand. So, you know, that's the gallery price. You know, they pay lots of money to rent the uh, space. <laughs> yeah. And they that's pay for the sellers, if they have a couple of employees or more. Marketing. Yeah, they pay for utilities, everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason is 50. Yeah, they yeah. charge double and, and or triple. So, I mean, basically, the question is if there's a contract with you, then you have to adhere to the contract. If there's not a contract, you have the sort of goodwill, badwill kind of feeling that the gallery may or may not. Um, and aside from the galleries, you actually kind of just touched on stepping on your clients to like on the customers chose. So let's say we have this gallery here. Let's say that Mary D is in a gallery elsewhere and you have a similar size sculpture here and it's half the price. No, that's not going to happen. Right, but, but if we're in a gallery, right? And so, and now they're walking here and they're considering buying one of your pieces there, but they're walking in here and seeing it so much cheaper. And then like, how do we deal with something like that? Because there's been a question of when people show things elsewhere for here and changing the price for here for a local and we're a small town. So how do we handle that kind of conversation if we need to? Um, I, would, I would tell you, and I, this also would, would go to Sal's question. So um, remember I said that it doesn't behoove you to sell your work at charity auctions and, you know, mm -hmm. so as an appraiser, so you don't want me one day to call you and say, Sal's gallery sales, 20, 24, 50, 45, 8, 10. Because when we do an appraisal, we're looking at the range of values. So you want to keep those values higher so you would defer. There's a, you defer your gallery sales because there's a concept that in appraising, it, you don't take the average value. So when, I, when I'm buying for a museum, I don't take the average of the whole artist's portfolio value. I take only the, 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 um, the uh, it's called the modal value. So I'm looking for the price point that's hit the most. And if it's hit, if, you're, if, you're, if your um, retail price is hit the most, if it's 40, 51%, that I'm seeing retail price, I'm going to use retail price for your appraised value. And the museum's going to pay that. But if I see it's 51% from Sal's own studio, then I'm going to tell the museum he sells on wholesale. And that's, that's, how, the, that's how my business works, is that we're always looking for the modal value, the most often price point, not the average. Not the average. We're looking for what the, what the market is paying most for, <coughs> retail, wholesale versus those two things. So it behooves the artist to sell um, through the gallery if they are represented by a gallery because that's the price point that I, sh I present to my clients, to my museums, to my insurance companies. Like in the case I was telling about this woman, she's mad at me, 2,000 versus 800. I'm like, okay, so I understand that, but you can reproduce this, or you can re you, and the artist will paint you this again for eight hundred. So you know, but you want you want me to tell you it's two thousand, um, and yet the artist sells most out of his own studio. So the insurance company was giving me hell on the back end, saying we happen to know that fifty one percent and and more of this artist's work sells out of his studio. So therefore. How can she claim that we owe her 2000 But that's how it works. It's the most, the modal price. So if, you, if it's 51% if it's retail, and they're 50, 20, 30, blah, 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 and then it's 49% Saul's studio, 10, 15, I'm going to go here because it's 51% of your 
total market comes from retail. Mm -hmm. And that's your value going forward forever in my business. Okay, so it's important for artists to be represented. No, but uh, Sal's question was he has the opportunity to be represented. Is it exclusive representation? Right. Is, it, is it how does he then sell to his clients that want to buy from him directly? Does he offer a discount? I said he can, but the long term of it is if I'm ever appraising or any, any of the art world is ever appraising Sal's work, we're going to, we're looking, yeah. we're looking, what's the majority of Sal's work being sold by? Is it being sold by the gallery or by Sal? Okay, great. So you're, if you're looking at an artist who's never been represented, you're still looking at their sales. Oh, sure. Okay. On, as well you know, on the death, when we die, yeah, uh, the price of the artwork could go higher. Yeah? And many artists uh, who worked in the past, uh, modern artists' uh, prices uh, higher in Sullivan gas as living artists' artwork, and, and they sell it better. So Polly's saying if you die, your work generally goes up. That is true. That's an okay. art market uh, mm -hmm. phenomena. Um, the choices, you know, I've worked with Solomon Goss many, many times. The choices that they, they make are um, not based, on, they do not have an artist that, for years I've been saying, could you please have just one contemporary artist? Because I'd love to buy a piece you know, my clients would love to buy one, just one, one contemporary artist. Well, we're mm -hmm. not ready for it yet. Oh. When are you going to be ready for it? I mean, we're talking about, what was it, Russia in 1901? <laughs> you know, the first <laughs> contemporary art show? I mean, yeah. when are you going to be ready for it? Uh -huh. they're, they're showing more contemporary since they changed ownership. Yes, more, yes. Yeah, the back yes. room is yes. usually contemporary. Yes. You know, the, Traditional stuff is the first. Yes, and I'm really glad Nathan's doing that. Yeah. And they, but but one real abstract artist. I'm not talking contemporary, but abstract. Oh, okay. I'd love to see really abstract work in town. Just one, somewhere in town. Like, uh, I just want to let everybody know that this concept of dying in your art gets more valuable. We're, we're not advocating that here <laughs> in the uh, but it makes studios. <laughs> but I know it hit me. Yeah. <laughs> is there is there anything? Uh, I can... How do you want it done? <laughs> can I bring up my? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so the pictures. So we want. Well, thank you. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.